Let's go back to something I said earlier. I said that routers forward packets from one network to another. In a sense, routers connect networks or subnets together. But how does the host device know when it needs a router's help? For that matter, how does it know where the router is? And if a router connects to more than one network, how does it know which one it's meant to forward the packet to? Well, one of these questions is very easy to answer. How does the host device know where the router is? Devices have a default gateway. The one we're looking at here is from Windows. This is the IP address of a router in the local network. So if a device needs a router's help with forwarding a packet, this is the IP address that it will send the packet to. Now onto another question. How does a device know it needs a router's help? Let's imagine that a device needs to send a packet to another device. It will look at the network part of the destination address. From this, it can see that it's in a different network to its own. It now knows the destination device is on a different network, so it knows it needs the help of its default gateway. You might notice that the destination IP is the device on the other network, not the IP address of the router. So why is this? Why isn't the destination IP the default gateway? That's the interesting thing about how layer two and layer three work together. The sender already knows the IP address of the router. That's the default gateway IP. It then uses a protocol called ARP or ARP or address resolution protocol to find the MAC address of the router. It then encapsulates the packet with ethernet headers to make a layer two frame. It then sends the frame to the router's MAC address. So layer two operates within a network to deliver a packet from one hop to another. The destination MAC will change with each hop or router that the packet passes through. You may recall, this is frame rewrite. So when the router needs to forward the packet on, it simply repeats the process. It uses ARP to get the destination MAC address, encapsulates the packet into a frame, and then sends it. That was a simple topology. A more complicated one might look like this. In this case, we have one switch with a few devices connected. Some are in VLAN 10, and some are in VLAN 20. Even though they are on the same physical switch, they are still separated, and they are in separate VLANs. As we know, devices in different VLANs can't communicate with each other directly. They need a router's help. So we add a router, but which VLAN does it go in? It needs to be in both VLANs. We could use a separate link for each VLAN, but there's a more convenient way. We create one link which is a trunk link. The trunk link carries the traffic for both VLAN 10 and VLAN 20. Notice that while routers focus on layer three, they still support layer two functions. We could even configure an ether channel here if we wanted to. At this point, we would configure two virtual interfaces on the router. These are sometimes called SVIs or switched virtual interface. They are a virtual interface that maps a VLAN to an IP address. With these interfaces, the router can receive packets on one VLAN and forward them on to another. Later in the lab, we'll explore how to configure that. Now that works well, but is there anything we can do to simplify it? Yes, there is. Just as routers support layer two functions, many switches now support layer three. Not all switches, of course. The low end cheaper ones won't do it, but many business grade switches do. So in our topology, we're going to start by removing the router. Then we configure the SVIs, that's the virtual interfaces, on the switch. Now the switch will handle routing between the VLANs. Do you want to see how to do this? First step, we need to create VLANs 10 and 20. Now we create the SVI. That's the virtual interface that provides the bond between VLAN and IP address. For this, we use the command interface VLAN and then the VLAN number. This creates a new interface, which is shut down by default. That's why we get this message. Now we assign an IP address to the interface. This is exactly the same as if we were configuring a physical interface. And finally, issue the no shut command to enable it. 
we still get a log message telling us that the interface is down. Do you want to guess why this is? The switch in my lab doesn't have anything plugged in yet. That means there are no interfaces on VLAN 10 that are up. For an SVI to be up, there must be at least one interface in that VLAN. Let's now repeat the process with VLAN 20. You'll notice it's the exact same procedure and this interface is also down. At this point, I'd like to issue a small warning. Some switches need to have routing enabled. If it's not enabled, the commands we used won't work. If you suspect this applies to your switch, first try using the IP routing command. With any luck, it's just gonna be that simple for you. In some other cases, there may be more complicated steps using an SDM command. If you need it, I have a link in the description that will show you how that's done. Now, back to the topology, and I have a question for you. Do you think we need to use a virtual interface when configuring a switch? Could we give a real physical interface an IP address if we wanted to? The answer is yes, we can, but the process is a little different. When we try to add an IP address to a regular switch interface, the switch rejects the command. I did accidentally use a bad IP address here, but that's not the issue. The problem is the switch is simply not accepting the IP address command. This is because a switch interface only operates at layer two by default. And as you remember, IP addresses are layer three. We can change this default behavior by issuing the no switch port command. Switch port refers to a layer two interface. By removing this command, we're changing this to a layer three interface. This is often called a routed interface. Now that we've done this, we can add an IP address. We've seen that layer three routers can work at layer two. We've also seen that layer two switches can work at layer three. This does blur the lines between routers and switches a bit, doesn't it? Does this mean that routers and switches are effectively the same? What do you think?